so hello everyone. I'm Dr. Louise Hardiman. Uh, welcome to the seventh and sadly last event in the webinar series from Talent to Tbilisi, Art Across Boundaries in the Age of Empire. So I'm the co-convener of the series together with uh, Lauren warner Trelaw of Kingston University, and we're delighted so many of you are here today. We'd like to thank the Visual and Material Culture Research Centre at Kingston for generously funding and hosting this series. Today, we're thrilled to have with us Sato Muhalian, who will present her talk, Armenian Painterly Modernity and the Union of Armenian Artists, 1916 to 21. Lauren will introduce Muhalian shortly, but first I'll set out some housekeeping points. Today's lecture is being recorded. Your cameras have been turned off and your microphones have been muted. Our intention is for the video to be shared publicly on the Kingston University website. Following the presentation, Lauren will moderate a Q&A session. And please note that this part of the session will not be recorded. During the Q&A, if you think of a question at any point or during the presentation, you uh, can use the function on your screen Q&A. And if your version of Teams doesn't have that, then during the questions, you will be able to use raise your hand. Um, so now I'll we'll hand over to Lauren to introduce our speaker today. Hello, I'm Lauren Warner Trelor, a doctoral researcher at Kingston School of Art at Kingston University. And I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today. Sato Mukhralian is a PhD student in modern European history at the City University of New York Graduate Center, where she will continue to research Armenian visual culture and its intersections with mass violence and state formation from the late 19th century through the early Soviet era. She recently completed an MA in liberal studies at the same institution. This talk draws from her thesis. She's also a professional flautist with more than 40 chamber music recordings and the author of Feast of Ashes, The Life and Art of David Ohanesian, which was published by Stanford University Press, a biography of her ceramicist grandfather. The book was long listed for the 2020 Penn America Jacqueline Bogard Well Biography Award and a finalist for the American Association of Publishers 2020 Professional and Scholarly Excellence Prose Awards in biography and autobiography. Sato, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for like all of our wonderful contacts over the last year as we've been planning this and uh, it was postponed and thankfully everyone is, is okay. Um, and I would like to just formally say thank you to Dr. Louise Hardiman, Lauren Warn Warner Trellor, Billy Parker, who's been wonderful. And of course the Kingston School of Art for creating this wonderful series and for inviting me. And I have a few more thank yous um, to the curators, um, Haikush Sahakian, Satanik Chukazian, Sera Khanjan, and the archivist Tarifsi Dayan of the National Gallery of Armenia in Yerevan, uh, as well as Professor Levon Chukazian and Satanik Bartasarian of Yerevan State University, Professor Sebu Aslanian of UCLA, and Dr. Gizem Tongo um, of Ankara for their help. Also wanted to thank my thesis advisor, the wonderful Professor Timothy Alborn of the City University of New York Graduate Center. Um, I also cannot fail to mention before I begin the talk proper, um, this very difficult moment in Armenian history uh, in which the ethnic cleansing of 120,000 indigenous Armenians from their ancestral home in Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh as is known to Armenians, from what was until these last three weeks, an ancient enclave of Armenians within the borders of what is now Azerbaijan. The Nagorno-Karabakh region also contains an extensive legacy of historic Armenian material culture and religious monuments, which have been targets of cultural destruction. And it's critical at this moment to keep international focus on the preservation of these at-risk heritage sites and if you're not familiar with them, mostly uh, medieval uh, buildings, absolutely beautiful. I would refer you to the um, Washington DC institution, the Museum of the Bible. Uh, you can see a link there, which has put up um, a page 
with short videos on each of these sites, it's, it's worth exploring if you're not familiar with them. But thank you to all of you who've tuned in. I'm grateful for an opportunity to present a small extract from my studies, and I look forward to the discussion following. Um, in 2021, while looking through archival materials in the library of the National Gallery of Armenia, I came across a negative and a print of this 1916 photo of the Union of Armenian Artists taken in Tiflis, modern Tbilisi, the multi multicultural multilingual capital of the Viceroyalty of the Caucasus, which was then part of the Russian Empire, and where at the time Armenian community formed a slight majority. Um, the portrait caught my attention for several reasons. First of all, because the date signaled to me that on the other side of the Ottoman Russian border, there were ongoing massacres of Armenians, conscription of Armenian men into labor gangs, sexual violence, and forced migrations of Armenians towards Syria, where further killings, famine, and epidemic disease made the chance of surviving quite bleak. All of these circumstances collectively have come to be known as the Armenian genocide, once the word genocide was coined by the Polish jurist Rafael Lemkin in the early 1940s. Yet captured in this photo was also the founding scene of an arts institution, despite the horrific circumstances. And although I'd repeatedly seen the photo reproduced in Armenian art historiography, and I'd often read mention of the Union of Armenian Artists, I'd rarely encountered more than a fleeting reference to it. I was also caught by their self-presentation, dapper, distinctly modern, I mean, it's not exactly a Dutch regent's group portrait, but I was struck between the contrast of this sun-dappled scene and my knowledge of the ongoing violence. In describing the Russian Paradvishniki, the Mobile Art Exhibitionary Association, also known as the Wanderers, art historian Andrei Shabanov emphasizes the self-consciousness of their highly stylized group photos intended to impress their status as a partnership. And indeed, as Sornyans himself, he, who you can see underneath that white arrow, um, Sornyans, who had exhibited with the Paradvishniki since 1894 and became a member in 1910, he became well acquainted with these modes of self-presentation. The Union of Armenian Artists' four founders were born between 1860 and 1880, a very dynamic era toward the end of the Ottoman era of Tanzimat reforms and in Russia, the Great Reforms. And in the Russian art milieu, there was the so-called revolt of the 14 art students who broke from the Imperial Academy in 1863 and presaged the formation of the Paradvishniki with their new critical realism. So for cultural producers in both empires, this period also marked a continuing shift from imperial patronage to market creation, from official state-controlled salons and exhibitions to artist-led collectives. And although both the Russian and Ottoman imperial administrations continued to capitalize on art production and exhibitions in international fora as vehicles to counter demeaning Western stereotypes and assert themselves as modernizing states, Partnerships like the Paradvishniki were also striving to create new patronage models and to place the artists themselves into sharper focus. However, I wondered, how would all of that work if there was no state to rebel against and if there were no state institutions or salons to break from, and if the nation existed only as a collective identity across a diaspora? And what if such an art institution as these four figures founded also functioned as a vital form of social communication at an extremely precarious moment? In Armenian art historiography, these painters are credited with founding national schools of art, but I wondered if that narrative fully accounted for their individual agency. So I think these questions echo a number of questions that have come up in the course of this really valuable series from which I've learned a lot. Um, on both sides of the Russian-Ottoman border, culturally engaged parties were calling for the development of distinctive national artistic styles. Cultural critics, especially in Russia, were writing newspaper essays on the subject in what Slavic historia, historian uh, Katya Dianina calls the, quote, gradual democratization of art and discourse underway in the second half of the 19th century, end quote. So for artists who aligned ethnically with the regional hegemons, as well as ethnic Armenians or others who held hybrid or multiple identities, 
Since growing mass press and artist-led collectives, they offered new platforms to assert identity. By the time of the union's founding in 1916, the mass press offered, as of course Benedict Anderson and Arab Hobsbawm have pointed out, a forum for debates over the very meaning of nation and the relationship between the idea of nation and, in this case, an Armenian national art. Trans-imperial Armenians engaged vigorously in such discourses in their own flourishing journalistic press. For them, the mix of exhibitionary culture, the related mass press, and the associated logos, catalogs, and other ephemera constituted what I think of as a whole ecosystem of Armenian identity that will, as we'll see, actually presaged the founding of the first modern Armenian nation state. So here are the four artists plotted according to their birthplaces. You see Saryan at top, uh, born in New Nakhichevan in Russia proper, Surnyans in Akhalsika, a Georgian city with a historic concentration of Armenians, Tadavosyan in Etchmiadzin, the seat of the Armenian Apostolic Church, and then the Ottoman Armenian Panos Terlemesyan, born in Van, which until the genocide of 1915 had been among the very oldest continuously inhabited Armenian centers. So for me, these four scattered across diverse trans-imperial Armenian cultural nodes and grouped almost by accent by virtue of their collective involvement with the union offered an opportunity to explore a bit what it meant to be a modern Armenian painter. How do they navigate their multiple identities and how did their work converse with that of their non-Armenian contemporaries? And why have these accomplished artists canonized in Armenian art historiography been included only marginally with the partial exception of Saryan in global art historiography? Between its founding in 1916 and 1921, the Union of Armenian Artists mounted six major exhibitions. During the same time span, the First World War raged, more than a million Ottoman Armenians were killed or forcibly exiled, Russia saw the 1917 revolution, civil wars, and some 300,000 Ottoman Armenians would flee to the South Caucasus and Persia. Armenians did briefly succeed in establishing an independent Republic of Armenia between 1918 and 20, only to suffer further Turkish attacks, the invasion of the Red Army, and Armenian Sovietization at the very end of 1920. So clearly anti-Armenian mass atrocities played a role in the decision to form a proto-national arts organization. According to Surinyans, the idea of a union of Armenian artists had been circulating since the last late 19th century, but it didn't crystallize until these four arrived at the scene of a refugee crisis in Etchmiadzin in Russian Armenia in the late summer of 1915. So ahead, I'm gonna offer three short sections. First, a thumbnail of who Armenians are. Uh, many of you may already know this and forgive me for uh, the repetition, but some of you may not be familiar, familiar. So just a brief overview. Second, I'll introduce these four artists in their transcultural formations up until 1915. What did it mean for them to be Armenian and how was their mobility inscribed in their work? with a few images to give a sense of how we might place them. And finally, we'll look at the founding of the Union of Armenian Artists and its function as a construct of national identity, not created by a state, but by independent artists themselves, and illustrating the weight that visual and cultural production and its producers have borne traditionally in Armenian identity formation. So in this wonderful web series that very valuably features art of non-majority groups in the age of empire, we start with the question, who are the Armenians? And as best as leading historians such as Ronald Sunni surmise, the ancestors of Armenians some 2,600 years ago inhabited a high plateau of approximately 60,000 square miles, encompassing the eastern part of modern Turkey, the southern Caucasus, and northern Iran. Over centuries, early Armenians organized around Irano-Armenian extended family structures called Naharars, what we might think of as uh, feudal land-based estates. Armenians maintained an Indo-European language and identity, even while living under conquest or vassalage and mastering multiple languages. These eras and systems were punctuated by Armenian kingdoms and principalities, as we see in this map. 
The building blocks of a modern Armenian identity emerged in the early fourth century with the Christianization of the Armenian people and the invention of an Armenian alphabet in the fifth century, created in order to translate the Bible into Armenian. So these foundational events dating back to the era of Armenia's paleo-Christian history have often been memorialized in the visual arts. And here we see those early translators depicted in an early 18th century tile made in Kutahya, Western Ottoman ceramic center dominated by Armenian artisans. So the frequency with which this type of scene recurs reflects the centrality of both a written language and visual production in Armenian identity formation. Sometime after that fifth century invention of the alphabet, Moses Koronatsi recorded the first Armenian history, consolidated known historical events, myths, and origin stories. And Armenians continued to disperse, building small and far-flung merchant colonies across Europe and Asia. And with the establishment of the first Armenian Gutenberg-type press in Venice in 1512, literate clergy ushered in a long period of textual production. Some 40 Armenian presses scattered through Europe and Asia were funded largely by pious merchants who patronized the printing of volumes that supported the teachings of the Armenian church. And this printed production shaped a trans-imperial, trans-diasporic Armenian collective identity over time. The pattern continued, although of course it became increasingly secular into the 20th century. And I would refer anyone interested uh, in this overlay between the Armenian diasporic networks and Armenian printing presses to an important new volume by Sebu Aslanian of UCLA. In this book, he also recounts how almost a century after the publication of that first volume, Armenians suffered two more very large, very violent dispersals. In the 1590s, in the Eastern Ottoman regions, uh, the Chalali rebellions propelled Armenians westward and in the forced migrations under Safavid ruler Shah Abbas I, who pushed some 300,000 Armenians and others from the frontier regions of Eastern Asia Minor toward Iran. And there in a suburb of Isfahan named New Julfa, a new Armenian colony prospered in the Iranian silk industry and greatly enlarged Armenian trade networks across Eurasia. By 1828, the majority of Armenians lived either within the Ottoman or Russian empires, between and among the numerous non-dominant groups that have been the subjects of other talks in this series. Uh, censuses of the period are inexact, but by the late 19th century, there may have been some 2.5 million Armenians living in the Ottoman Empire and another 2 million living in Imperial Russia, especially in the Caucasus around Tiflis, the cultural capital of the Transcaucasus where uh, historian Richard Hovhannisian con uh, estimated that they constituted about 45% of the city's population. So just a few relevant large um, themes. First, Armenians, as we see, have been widely dispersed, living within multi-ethnic urban cores or scattered in villages or districts where they sometimes constituted a majority. Second, although most Armenians in both empires were agrarian, Others were skilled craft persons and they developed distinctive practices in carpet, textile production, ceramics, stone carving, etc. Often syncretizing features from surrounding cultural groups, but also reiterating certain visual elements as emblems of Armenian identity. Third, although such craftspersons might be taken as spoils of war for economic or trade reasons, as was partly the case with Shavas I, uh, for example, many of the skilled artisans and silk merchants he brought to Iran prospered, even in the aftermath of devastating violence. So this pattern of regeneration, as we will see again with the Union of Armenian Artists, is a topic I hope to explore further in future studies. And finally, during relatively little of their history did Armenians enjoy politically, political sovereignty over a terrain. But despite that circumstance, the Armenian idea of us or nation is a constant refrain, a mental construct of nation. We're all familiar with the extent to which visualizing the nation was one of the most common painterly projects through the 19th century. And we'll see some of these visual representations but to adapt from art historian Patricia Minardi's argument that in the French context, we could also ask equally, um, 
if Armenian modernity revealed itself not only on the canvas, but also in the creation of institutions. So um, our brief time together today allows only very short glimpses of the formation of these artists up until 1915, but they shared several important traits. All were highly mobile, all four engaged with artistic ideas in circulation across Eurasia, each spent significant amounts of time on archeological or ethnographic uh, expeditions to historic Armenian sites where they sketched ruins, monuments, landscapes, and built a distinctive visual repertoire. In some of the slides, we'll see how they personalized and syncretized ideas in circulation, including imaginaries of the East. Also their memoirs and letters inform us that as they traveled, all four cultivated relationships with other Armenians, especially other artists. And this web of personal connections would come to the fore in 1916, when the founding members of the union set out to make contact with as many dispersed Armenian artists as possible. We begin with Varkas Surinyans, the oldest of the four, painter, architect, art historian, literary translator, born in 1860 in Achaltike in the Tiflis Gubernia. His father was an intellectual priest who, um, high ranking, who regularly published essays in Tiflis newspapers. Family moved to Crimea in 1868, where they befriended the famous Russian Armenian marinist, Ivan Ivazovsky, who reportedly encouraged the young painter's talent. Four years later, the family moved to Moscow, where Surinyans enrolled in the Lazarev or Lazarian Institute of Oriental Languages, where he learned Russian and Persian and studied drawing. In 1875, Surinyans enrolled in the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture and Architecture as an architecture student graduating four years later. And as we see in this painting, the rendering of architectural detail was an important through line in his painterly practice. In 1879, Soren Jans moved to Munich, joining other aspiring Armenian painters there. By mid-century, the city had become an important arts training center for Eastern Europe. And after earning his architecture diploma, he set his heart on becoming a painter. Now, in the 1850s, the artist Karl von Pilati and others had introduced new approaches to history painting that were well established in the Munich Academy of Fine Arts by the time Surinyans arrived. Also, during his six years in Munich, the Russian realist Vasily Vereshchagin had opened a studio there. So let's see how Surinyans responded to some of these ideas and how he deployed his visual imaginary in response to political events and anti-Armenian violence. In the mid-1890s, in the eastern Ottoman provinces, Sultan Abdul Hamid began a series of anti-Armenian pogroms, which came to be known as the Hamidian massacres. And Surinyans created several allegorical images in response to what many Armenians felt, which was that Europeans had abandoned their cause after the failure of promised Ottoman reforms. So we see here how Surinyans personalized a number of artistic ideas then in circulation, namely the construction of a national imaginary using autochthonous cultural elements, the feminized embodiment of the nation, the pointed use of Eastern architectural and ethnographic elements as part of the visual discourse. In his 1894, The Abandoned, a young girl, maybe an orphan, sits desolately outside the closed door her worldly possessions bundled up before her. And here we see an approach that Surinyans will employ repeatedly when depicting refugees. He restores them to their pre-catastrophe condition. Although she's weary and alone, she's beautifully attired, not in the rags that you might expect to see, but in the costume of her native region. And while she hides her face in despair, this vibrant attire signifies the persistence of Armenian cultural life. In this enlarged detail, we see how Surinyans has used the ornately carved, uh, he's presented this ornately carved door, which is modeled after a 1486 carved wooden door from the monastic complex in Sevan, which he had visited two years earlier. So these fresco paintings, which you see, and engravings embody the venerable Armenian church and its rich artistic traditions, which for Surinyans growing up in a religious household also signified the material and spiritual heritage of the Armenian nation. The ethnographic and architectural features of the abandoned, as well as the staging of a dejected soul against the closed door of a house of worship, 
also called to mind an 1873 work by Vasily Veresh Chekin, exhibited in Munich during, during Surinyansa's studies there. And I have to thank the wonderful 19V Russian Art History Seminar and its leaders, Dr. Margaret Shamu and Dr. Nikita Balagurov for um, this reference. Um, so here in the Veresh Chekin, we see two mendicants before the closed wooden doors of a masjid. And here too, the figure's morose postures contrast with their distinctively colorful Central Asian quilted robes and pointed fur-trimmed hats. Per art historian Sabina Weber, some major trends in Munich's mid-century history painting innovations are exemplified by Pilotti's Zeni at the Corpse of Wallenstein, where we see, in her words, quote, carefully staged, highly theatrical scenes, complete with historically accurate costumes, props, and settings that combined historical knowledge with a technical mastery of painterly and compositional effects. This painting caused a furor at the Munich Salon of 1855, and its su success led to uh, Pilati's appointment to the Munich Academy, and eventually he became director. He would go on to train a new generation to produce such emotionally potent works in a style that came to be known as historical colorism, which also offered a kind of painterly engagement with Leopold von Ranke's then recent dictum to record history as it happened. So how do these ideas translate to an Armenian context? We can see a pretty direct, uh, a, a pretty direct connection here in the second of Soren Yance's allegorical response to the Hamidian massacres, the 1895 trampled sanctity, where we see a murdered priest, a torn altar curtain, toppled censer, blackened candles, all of these signify the recency of the atrocity and the destruction, trampling of the holy objects, manuscripts, and the architectural setting itself, which had been preserved into the fictive present of this image, indicate an attack on the Armenian nation and the signifiers of its long established past. Art historian Manya Razaryan associated the scene with the sacking of the Holy Cross Church in Ottoman Van in 1895 and noted that nearly every day during this period, Tiflis and Van newspapers were reporting that monastic complexes around Lake Van were being mercilessly looted. Here we see uh, other elements drawn from uh, Soren Yance's architectural knowledge the carved stone cross framed by columns, which anchors the center of the painting, clearly modeled after one in the interior of the 1216 uh, St. John the Baptist Monastery. Um, and thanks to Christina Maranci for pointing out this, um, this similarity. Um, here we see a detail of the holy books mutilated and defined, and their extreme foregrounding kind of affirms the primacy of the holy word for a people of the book, as Armenians consider themselves. The loss of life is paralleled in the destruction of these precious cultural objects. And another one-to-one -one correspondence, the prone position of the two murdered men, each with his left arm extended, the drape of their garments, the suggestive use of light and shadow to direct the viewer's gaze. All of these elements connect them. One last detailed comparison. It's not clear if Ottoman statesman and painter Osman Hamdi Bey saw Surin Yance's trampled sanctity, which did circulate through the 1895-96 Paradvishniki circuit. But Hamdi Bey's 1901 painting Genesis bears several striking resemblances, and among them, the foreground of the defiled books and the censor. Moving to the second artist, Yegishe Tadevosian, who's often referred to as an Armenian Impressionist. He was born 10 years after Surnyans in 1870 in Etchmiadzin, the spiritual center of the Armenian church. Um, his uncle, the learned priest Nerses Hudaverdian, advised the family on the boy's early education and recognized his artistic talent. In 1881, Tadevosian left for Moscow also to attend the Lazarian Lazarev School, and in 1885, he was admitted to the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture. Among his teachers was Vasily Polenov, also a Paradvishnik, and who remained a cherished mentor throughout his life. So Tadevosian remained in the orbit of the Moscow Academy for about a decade, um, exhibiting in group shows, and in 1894, he received a, a silver medal, which funded his first travels. Also in 1894, 
He returned to Etchmiadzin to teach art at the Kevorkian Seminary, where he deepened his friendship with Gomidas Vartebe, the priest musicologist composer. And in this depiction of the young priest, Tadevosian displays what I think will become a recurring strategy in his work, um, a subtle mastery of scale in support of affect. Here, Gomidas occupies a modest place in the foreground. He's wrapped in contemplation and framed by rich greenery as he seeks the soothing balm of nature against his worries. In this 1895 work, Tadevosian, like Surinyans, composed a painterly response to the Hamidian massacres. This canvas depicts a desolate Armenian cemetery at moonrise and a poignant scene of leave taking. A young boy kneels to kiss a gravestone, while a man who actually bears some resemblance to Tadevosian himself, um, this man holds traveling cloaks and an umbrella with a horse-drawn carriage and driver awaiting the pair in the distance. So we see the sort of short breaststrokes restricted palette um, that conveys details of the lichen covered gravestones crumbling amid untended grass in the foreground. This painting and two others were exhibited in the 1896 edition of the Peredvizhniki touring circuit. And another of Tadevosian's best known paintings, the 1901 Adoration of the Cross, we see a humble figure reverently kissing a khachkar from behind, the viewer faces the beauty of the sunlit cross stone and the age-worn hand that rests upon it. Um, art historian Levon Shukazian argues convincingly that this work too may be read as a response to the Ottoman atrocities, but it also recalls contemporary Russian discourse about the primacy of expression in art, a view, of course, fiercely promoted by Leo Tolstoy and adopted in Moscow circles under the egalitarian idea of everythingness. So for a diasporic people whose uprootings had extended over centuries, the extraordinary carved stone monuments marked holy sites and graves all over historic Armenia from about the ninth century on. Um, here we see Tadevosian's uh, intimate, wonderful painting of his wife, Justine. Um, from 1901 to 1921, he served on the faculty of the Tiflis School of Painting and Sculpture, and he built a sizable teaching studio. Obviously, we see his uh, fascination with the effects of light and plein air painting, which uh, some Armenian historians like attribute to Tadevosian's first visit to Paris in 1900. But also, we can remember that within the Moscow School, especially um, with Polenov and Pasternak, um, you know, we also see this kind of fascination with light, the effects of light and plein air painting. So, of the three Russian Armenian artists, Saryan was the only one not born in Transcaucasian, Transcaucasia, and his long life and career overlapped with most of the Soviet era. Born to a rural family, he credited his daily communion with nature as his most formative influence. And when he died in 1972, he had managed to survive the 1930s purges. He was awarded the state's highest honors. He was given his own house museum. And he has indeed been the subject of many monographic publications. But my interview two years ago with his granddaughter, Sophie Sarian, now the chief curator of the museum that bears his name, reveals that this was not always a foregone conclusion. Saryan did face severe threats in the political repressions of the 1930s, and it was perhaps only the international awards and recognition he was receiving at the time that enabled him to evade serious harm. He also began his training at the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture at the age of 17. And after completing the five-year course, he continued studying in the portrait studio. He developed a close group of friends, including the painters Pavel Kuznetsov and Kuzma Petrov Votkin, who, like him, had arrived at the Moscow Academy from the provinces in 1897, and who introduced him to symbolist principles. Other artists in his close Moscow circle were Natalia Goncharova and Mikhail Larionov, uh, leaders in the Russian neo-primitivist movement. And so to quote from the neo-primitivist uh, manifesto, which I think is relevant here, um, the quote by Shevchenko, we are striving to seek new paths for our art, but we do not reject the old completely. And of its previous forms, we recognize above all the primitive, the magic fable of the old East. So in this early 
post-academy period in his own Orientalist engagements, Sarion created a wonderful series of works he called Fairy Tales and Dreams. He was beginning to experiment with washes of color and it basically made a complete break from his academic training. Uh, we can't fail to note that a year later, 1905, the Russian Revolution would begin with a violent outbreak of the Tsar's troops in St. Petersburg firing on a civilian demonstration. And art historian Christina Lauder argues that this shocking incident sparked an anti-establishment ethos that launched a number of uh, avant-garde styles, including neo-primitivism, which I believe left a clear mark on Sarian's work a little bit later in the decade. In 1907, he was one of 16 artists participating in the Blue Rose Group exhibition in Moscow uh, linked to Russian symbolism. Um, most of the artists, including Kuznetsov, uh, would knew each other from the Moscow School, and a number of them would go on with Sarian to exhibit with the World of Art, the Union of Russian Artists, and the Golden Fleece groups. So these approaches were obviously very far distant from Russian realism or genre painting, and they were received with a fair amount of criticism. But even here, we can see how Sarian is moving toward using areas of color as an essential element in his practice. Another turning point for him, 1906, he met the Moscow merchant art collector, Sergei Shukin, and like many other artists in that period, gained access to his remarkable collection of impressionist and post-impressionist works, which of course were highly um, inspiring in his development. Two years after Sarian's first encounter with Van Gogh in Shukin's salon, uh, we see the kind of rhythmic, virtuosic uh, brushstrokes that will characterize some of Sarian's uh, next fauve-like explorations. Um, he traveled to the North Caucasus, Constantinople, and Egypt, and uh, uh, obtained a new world of visual sources. He was particularly inspired by the art of ancient Egypt, um, which impressed him with its bold clarity. And his granddaughter told me that for him, the masks represented endurance and in eternity, and he would continue using these elements through the most ideologically challenging Stalinist times. 1910, he made tremendous professional breakthroughs. The Tretyakov Gallery made its first purchases of his work, including this Constantinople street scene. In 1911, the poet and art critic Maximilian Voloshin published an extensive consideration of his work in Apollon. And we see like some of the themes that will preoccupy him, the use of complementary colors, uh, a work that's extending into an infinite horizon and this sort of increasing abstraction of this Persian woman um, at a time when, you know, of course, in France, people were coming, uh, becoming also very interested in the African uh, mask. Of the four artists, Terlemessian had perhaps the most jagged path to his artistic formation, although he emerged ultimately as a brilliant realist landscape artist and portraitist. Born in 1865 near Van in Aigestan, um, in the easternmost province of the Ottoman Empire, he had a very, very difficult childhood marked by poverty and hunger. In 1881, um, he met Mukherjee uh, who had a teacher training college, uh, which he enrolled in. And Portokalian introduced Terlemesyan to progressive ideas and a concern for the collective condition of Armenians after centuries under Ottoman domination. Per historian Gerald Libaridian, Portokalian was a, quote, pivotal figure in the transition from a middle-class liberalism to an armed defense in the interest of the peasantry. So Portokalian established a newspaper that gave its name to the pro-revolutionary Armenikan political party of which Telemessian became a founding member. And after his graduation from uh, Vaughan Central College, Telemessian worked as a teacher of drawing and geometry in Vaughan, but he was engaged in political activities. And from 1890 on, he was arrested multiple times uh, imprisoned. He would escape from prison. He escaped to Tiflis at one point, worked as a laborer and typesetter until 1895. And then Hrimian Hayri, a very important figure in the Armenian church, gave him a scholarship that enabled him to move to St. Petersburg to study art. But from 1897 on, he, he continued being arrested by agents of the Ottoman Sultan, sometimes with the cooperation of the Tsarist police, and continuing incarcerations. Um, he made this beautiful, very piercing pencil self-portrait in Ravel 
prison, which is one of his very few surviving early works. He escaped once again, this time to Persia. Uh, Krim and Heidi supported him to travel to Paris. He enrolled in the Academy Julien and the Academy Colorossi. He took classes for 10 or more hours a day and continued his studies in Paris until 1904, occasionally visiting Etchmiadzin, where he studied manuscripts, architecture, and painted landscapes. And there in Etchmiadzin, he befriended Tadevosian as well as Gomidas Bar Tibet. In, after 1904, um, Terlemessian spent four years in Tiflis, uh, where he continued publishing essays on multiple subjects in newspapers, sometimes under pseudonyms. He traveled to Egypt and North Africa. And in 1910, he moved to Constantinople. He opened a teaching studio with Levon Kukjan, and he shared a flat with Gomidas, where they built a kind of very intellectual um, salon uh, filled with all sorts of interesting people. Um, the following year, the two men traveled to Kutahya, where Gomidas was born and where Charles Messiaen began this portrait. By 1913, his breakthrough year, he had a solo show in Constantinople. He exhibited the Gomidas portrait and several other works at the Munich International Exposition, also 1913, where he was awarded a gold medal. In late 1914, he returned to Vaughan. The first time he had come back in many, many years, he painted as much as he could. He reconnected with his network of friends, including those who were politically involved. On April 24th, 1915, Gomidas and more than 200 other leading figures in Constantinople were rounded up, arrested, and deported into the interior of the country where most of them would be murdered. This was the very first public salvo of the Young Turk Armenian Genocide. Also in April, Terlemessian participated in the armed resistance of Vaughan, which was one of the very few attempts to fight back against the mass killings and deportations. The Vaughan defenders prevailed. They formed a government that lasted nearly six weeks. But when Russian troops who had helped support them uh, abruptly withdrew in July, Turkish soldiers and Kurdish Hamidiye immediately recaptured the city and nearly the entire population took flight mostly on foot toward Russia and Persia. And in this burning summer heat with very few supplies, these refugees, columns of refugees, including Terlemessian, uh, passed between them epidemic malaria, typhus, dysentery. And by one migration historian's count, in the summer of 1915, of 100,000 Armenians who fled from Vaughan, some 35,000 died of starvation and disease en route to the Russian Empire, and thousands more died uh, upon arrival from famine and, and epidemic disease. So Terlemessian arrived in Russian Armenia in the late summer of 1915. Along the way, he had lost the 76 paintings he was carrying. Surinians, Tadavosian, Sarian each arrived independently to offer assistance to the refugees who were filling the grounds of the monastic complex in Etchmiadzin. Sarian was horrified by his sense of powerlessness as he watched women and children dying in the streets every day. Surinians remained in Etchmiadzin for six months, volunteering help, documenting the refugees by drawing and painting them. He would circulate these within the 1916-17 edition of the Pared Vishniki, and he published newspaper essays documenting what he saw. So in Tiflis, um, the, the circle of Armenian artists, including our four founders, decided finally to formalize a union. Uh, Sornyans had credited Ivasovsky with the original late 19th century idea of gathering Armenian artists from throughout the diaspora to form a union. The elder painter had lamented that while there were many accomplished Armenian artists scattered all over the world, they were all isolated from each other. But the obstacles to creating a national school of art had been, in fact, a microcosm of the problems faced by diasporic Armenians at large which is how do you forge a common ground among widely disparate thinkers shaped in diverse cosmopolitan nodes? And although the idea of union resurfaced again in 1913, it took the mass atrocities of 1915, a recognition that help from European great powers would not be forthcoming, and the recentering of the trans-imperial Armenian population into the South Caucasus to catalyze both a national artistic association and then two years later, of course, the formation of a state. 
The Armenian diaspora had long been connected through nodes of commerce and travel, and the artists had formed new social connections as they, you know, studied abroad, exhibited abroad, engaged in ethn ethnographic exposition, uh, expeditions. The Union of Armenian Artists would be constructed with the intention of creating a new cultural node within this global diasporic network, building on interpersonal ties accrued by means of circulation of its artist members over time. Tadavosian, with his years of teaching behind him, was elected chairman. Surinyans brought his organizational experience, two decades of involvement with the Paragvishniki. Saryan had, of course, exhibited with many of the most important recent recent Russian avant-garde movements, collectives. Terlamesians had connections in the Ottoman capital and like Surinians had been publishing newspaper essays for years. On February 24, 1916, a bilingual charter in Armenian and Russian was approved and published, largely drafted by Surinians. It stated three major purposes. The first, was to spread artistic education among Armenians through painting, sculpture, architecture, and graphic arts. The second was to create the Armenian style, recreate the Armenian style in art and artistic industry. And the third was to approach the national spirit and everyday life in artistic works. Other goals included the establishment of permanent gallery museums around the Transcaucasus, exhibitions throughout the Armenian, uh, the, sorry, Russian Empire, publication of periodicals, library, uh, studio classes, etc. And men and women were invited to join. Over the first year and until the first exhibition, the board met 32 times. And over the course of that year, they attempted to reach every dispersed Armenian artist to involve them. The group chose a logo designed by Starion, uh, a bird with grapevines set within a leaf as a sign of new life, according to the artist's granddaughter. The design drew on very old Armenian iconography, uh, which was possibly introduced to Starion by Tadavosian, um, this Armenian bird mosaic, uh, the floor of a funerary chapel in Jerusalem, which had been excavated in 1894 and was by then, um, by 1916, 17, widely reproduced um, in postcards and photographs. The publication of the charter set off an immediate round of newspaper essays on a near daily basis in the popular dailies. Tiflis Armenians were like very avid newspaper readers and so it would have been hard to miss the public dialogue. Um, but this discourse also contained allusions to fear of government spies, the need to avoid overt political expressions, and also many mentions of the ongoing human devastation and purposeful cultural destruction. Writing in Horizon on March 16th, Terlamesian argued for the need for a national organization, and he ended his, um, he ended his essay with a, a plea. He said, he writes, dear Armenian artists, friends, let's join and participate in this company and make desperate efforts to move toward the light and forward without being depressed by the current terrible horrors. Shirvan Zadeh, a, a popular writer, uh, also contributed to the public discourse. He wrote, quote, it is the moral duty of the Armenian society and the press to welcome this enterprise. There's a demand for a union of Armenian painters, sculptors, and architects living far from each other. He continued, the homeland, that is, the nation, must have fine art. And initial public meeting was announced, a printed ticket incorporated Saryan's logo and sculptural motifs from the Akhtamar Cathedral in Vaughan. Newspapers announced cash prizes for works that best captured the Armenian spirit. And on February 5th, 1917, the first exhibition opened in Tiflis. It included 333 works by 55 artists, including Armenians from both the Russian and Ottoman regions, as well as Russian painters, um, Polenov and Alexander Golovin sent works to express their support. Reviews mentioned that 50 of the works represented landscapes and other scenes from Ottoman Armenian regions of Garin, Mush, and Akhtamar, all of which had lost almost their entire Armenian populations. Over the month of the exhibition, 15,000 people attended, more than 100 works sold with a value of about 18,000 rubles, um, which is quite remarkable, like with war and 
revolution going on. Um, I've only found one photo, one exhibition photo uh, in the archive of the National Gallery of Armenia in Tadevosian's Fonds. So a major review in Ordisan noted, quote, after, after all, every nation has its own language, civilization, and unique art. The more talented a nation is, the more original its art is. Therefore, every nation must have its own organizations to clarify, emphasize, and develop the essence of their own art. So this first exhibition of Armenian artists is a welcome expression of the self-knowledge of Armenian art, which should gradually become more and more expanded. In time, all our scattered painters, sculptors, and architects will gather under the ba uh, banner of this company, and only in this way can we interest foreigners and at least take our modest place in the history of art. On May 28, 1918, Armenia declared itself to be an independent republic and established a government, which eventually included a ministry of education. The second exhibition took place also in Tiflis in April of 1919, and the third um, in May of 1919 in the new Armenian capital of Erevan, a modified version of the second exhibition. And the nascent Armenian government took interest in the Union of Armenian Artists, and in June, of 1919 purchased nearly the entire inventory of the exhibition as the foundation of a collection for a planned state museum. By December of 1920, however, this new Armenian Republic was under attack and with the loss of some 100,000 more Armenian lives entered the process of Sovietization. In June of 21, 1921, the fourth exhibition took place in the newly established Armenian art house in Tiflis, the High Artun, this would be the last exhibition in the Georgian capital. The fifth exhibition took place in Erevan in July of 1921 in the Hall of Workers. 34 artists participated, 272 works exhibited. And in this new Soviet era, the introduction of a state press, the creation of art departments in the new urban school districts, all of these were positive developments for the livelihood of professional artists. But, um, the, and also the August decree formalizing the founding of a state museum. But many people left, many artists and intellectuals left Soviet Armenia at this time, including Terlamesyan. He returned to Constantinople twice. He helped organize two exhibitions under the Union's patronage. And the second would be the Union's final exhibition, uh, billed as the sixth exhibition which opened on November 22nd, 1921 in allied occupied Constantinople. But there was a subtle change to the name of the, collect of the collective. What had been the Union of Armenian Artists was now the Union of Artists of Armenia, Hayastani Arvesta Kedneri Mutun. The exhibition received a great deal of coverage in the Constantinople Armenian press with strong hopes for the future. But in the newly Soviet Armenia, the Union of Armenian Artists was viewed with suspicion uh, as a nationalist and capitalist enterprise and therefore to be condemned. The art critic Lazar Rempel in his 1932 book, Painting in Soviet Transcaucasia, spoke of a bourgeois nationalist enterprise such as the Union of Armenian Artists, whose emblem for him represented what he called feudal art. So in the early Soviet years, as art historian Artur Avagian explains, all the pre-existing national art groups were disbanded. And in Tiflis, as in Tiflis, a new Soviet Armenian House of Armenian Art uh, was built in Yerevan, which per Rempel organized nine exhibitions over nine years. But this brief lifespan of the Union of Armenian Artists, which materialized national aspirations in art and presaged the political rise of a nation state, ended shortly after the first Republic of Armenia fell. Perhaps that photo of the four founders, so often reprinted in Armenian art historiography, but so rarely elaborated, also serves as a kind of nostalgic memory container for the brief moment when, in the midst of violent ethnic destruction, Armenia constituted itself as an independent state for the first time since 1375 CE, before falling to Soviet rule for the next 70 years. And if we could perhaps see these artists as modern institution builders beyond the familiar but cherished national frame, perhaps we could then integrate them more fully 
as agents and actors in the complex and interwoven strands of global art history. Thank you.